Hello, everybody. I'm Marc-Antoine Godin, and welcome to the Basu and Godin Notebook. Arpen, always enjoyable to uh, to hear that new jingle from Greg McPherson. It's, uh, it's catchy. It's, uh, I'll get I'll get used to it. Uh, yeah, I'll easily get used to it. <laughs> great, great response to it too. I think a lot of the listeners enjoyed it. Uh, it's a banger. It's a banger. Yeah. I, I like it. It's got some yeah, beat. Sure. That's I really I really like the energy coming into the show with that. So. Thanks again, Greg McPherson, who uh, who responded how, how thrilled he is that we're using his stuff. But we're more thrilled, Greg, that we have your stuff to use. So thank you again. There you go. So uh, the Canadians won their uh, a third game in, uh, third game in a row on Thursday night against Philly. Caden uh, Primo came one minute close to earn a third consecutive shutout at home, which we mm-hmm. have not seen in a Montreal Canadiens uniform since Jacques Plante in 1954. So that would have been quite Oof. a feat, but yeah, <laughs> it didn't happen yeah. that way. Um, yeah. Do you think that, uh, oh, what, yeah, let, let me start with this. Do you think that uh, th- that late success, you know, late in the season, the fact that they can really get on the roll here is going to be something that collectively they can truly build on or – you look down the 417 to Ottawa, where year after year the Senators are so good late in the season when it doesn't mean anything for their season anymore. They don't seem to build from those late season successes and carry it over to the next year. So which one is of the two do you think is going to be for Montreal? I don't think uh I don't think you can carry late success collectively over as a group. The group changes over the course of the off season, even if the core elements are still there. Um, but I think individually you can carry that over sometimes, you know, it's, uh, it's especially as a young player and especially players, there's a lot of the players that are in uniform with the Canadians. Now um, I think of a guy like James Struble who, you know, went through some ups and downs confidence wise and just, effectiveness wise uh, and sort of taught himself, corrected himself a bit, was talking yesterday before the game about how he felt he had slipped into uh, normalcy or complacency. And so, you know, going through that, going through that process this season and, and finishing strong, I think will be important for him, especially going into training camp next year when the rodeo on defense is going to be just a, uh, it's, very compelling wild. element. <laughs> yeah, wild, according to Mike Matheson. Yeah. Very wild element of training camp next year. Uh, Jordan Harris, I think you could say the same thing. There's, I think there's individual guys, obviously Slath, Suzuki, Caulfield. I mean, there's there's a number of guys who I think individually you carry some of this over. And and, and I think that one of the differences, or not a difference, but one of the elements of, of how the Canadians are ending the season is just the quality of teams they're facing. You know, they have one of the most difficult schedules in the in the league going down the stretch. Yeah. And so, you know, last night they beat a Philadelphia Flyers team who are scratching and clawing and trying to get into the playoffs. Um, performing, you know, obviously beating Colorado in Colorado where no one wins. Um, that, that effort in Edmonton, you know, th- there's there's some signature games here where the Canadians are proving something to themselves that I think could, can be valuable, but I think there has to be some, uh, there has to be some, some not concern, but like you have to be wary of overstating what this stretch of games could mean. But yeah. when you're in a process like the Canadians are in, you know, every little element helps to kind of, I guess, reassure what they're doing. Like that's what I found interesting. Like yesterday before the game, I asked Marty, you know, you, you and any, any other coach always says, you know, sometimes the guy just needs to go upstairs and get a different perspective on the game. So Marty going home to be with his family, to be with his son, um, Mason, as he was going through uh, some health issues, um, gave him that chance. Basically was the equivalent of him going up into the press box and watching the game from a different point of view. 
And I wondered if, if he got a different point of view or a different perspective. And what he says, I found it reassuring. I found it was validating basically what they were working on. He thought it was a good exercise and it did give him a different perspective. But that perspective just confirmed yeah. what he thought he was seeing from ice level or in video sessions or what have you. Um, so he found that reassuring. So I think there's a certain level of confidence that you can gain as a group in terms of how you play, in terms of what you're trying to do on the ice, this, the, the concepts or systems or whatever you want to call it. Knowing that that's effective could help going into next season. Yeah. I like the fact that he says that he finds it reassuring. Uh, and you, you're mentioning, you're mentioning the uh, signature games, uh, the one against mm -hmm. Colorado. It's definitely one of those yeah. games where the team can say, we're raising the standards. We're showing our coach what we're capable of doing. Uh, um, they're not at a, at a point where they're able to show it every night, but they, they can show at least that they've got it in, in them. And then it's, it's, up, it's their job and the coaching coach's job is to afterwards to take it out of them on a more consistent basis. But, this idea that they would go over there and it'd be uh it would be just a slaughter because nobody wins in denver uh it's it's it, it didn't ring true this time and th it was an impressive performance from the, from that perspective but mm -hmm. um we've heard martin saying we talk a lot about how he's proud of his group how we're we're so close and when When we're good, our good is very good. Is that it's excellent? Things like it's that. Elite. He's been really he called it elite. Yeah, it depends on the day, right? Sometimes it's very good. Sometimes of, it's excellent. Sometimes it's elite. A, that was a bit of an exaggeration on his part, but yeah, he used the word elite yeah. the last time he mentioned that. So, yeah, but he sees the glass half full, and you could argue, you know, looking at the standings, say, hey, guys, I mean, you're what twenty six, twenty seventh in the standings. Mm -hmm. You're far from the playoffs. Are you going to lower the bar and content yourself with so little? You could per people could perceive things that way, but mm -hmm. I think that Martin Saint Louis is looking as a very realistic view of the, and, and has a realistic uh, pulse on on his team and where it's at now. But I think it's going to be interesting to see how time goes on. How he's going to be able to go from a, a a coach who readily admits that he's a player's coach right now, uh, who's going to be able to baby tighten his grip on his players a little bit and start becoming more demanding. Arbor Jack mm -hmm. I told me yesterday morning, he says he's already more demanding than he was last year because last year there was a bunch of us who were first year players and uh Even though they had certain ex uh, expectations toward us, they didn't know exactly, uh, you know, what we they would get from us. So as as they played us over the course of the season, they said, "Oh, this guy can do this. Oh, he can do that." So everything was a little bit gravy. But now mm -hmm. there are certain things that's been set in stone, and it's now there are expectations now. Show us now how you can take this to an uh, another level. So there's more urge. There's more, um, exp yeah, higher expectations this year than last year, and it's going to go continue to grow as seasons went on, uh, go will go on. So I'm intrigued to see how a head coach, while remaining true to himself, is able to adapt his message and slowly but surely tighten the grip and becoming more demanding after being so understanding uh and 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 welcoming and a glass half full type of guy uh in this you know his first couple of seasons behind the canadians bench so it's a trajectory that you could say well of course it's going to be like that but you look at certain teams when they reach a certain level with their progression they say ah that coach is probably not the right guy anymore for us we have we need a different mm -hmm. type of message expressed a different way but in the Montreal Canadiens case it's going to be up to Martin Saint-Louis to slowly but surely modify his message 
and tweak the delivery so that it ad adapts to where the team is at. So I look forward I to seeing that. I don't know if he has to adapt his message necessarily, but he definitely has to adapt uh, how he doles out, how he how he handles accountability, right? It's um, I remember there was a game. Uh, well, I think the Flyers are actually a great example of this, and 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 a great example of what the Canadians might one day have to do, and what Marty might one day have to do. I and mean, listen, Tanner Pearson's been out of the lineup for a while now. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that this happened after the trade deadline. Uh, but, you know, it's it's no. clear that Tanner Pearson is going to be leaving at the end of the season. And, and you'd rather get Michael Pizzetta and Jesse Ullinen some reps and Rafael Harvey Pinard and whoever else Pearson would potentially come in for. Um, and that's not to say that Pearson is not going to play for the rest of the season, but that's a, that's a developmental decision, an organizational decision based on where they're at. Well, you look at the Flyers and – St. Louis mentor, John Tortorella, what he's been doing. Uh, you know, Sean Couturier played fourth line center last night. Cam Atkinson played because they needed a body, but those are the two highest paid forwards on the Flyers. Um, two highest paid players, actually, if I'm flat out, um, if I'm not mistaken. And they've been scratched of late. And, and, and Tortorella explained again before the game yesterday that he wants to put together um, – the group of the 20 best players he feels can win a game for them that night because that's where they're at. They're in a playoff race. Points are important. They're more important than development or they're more important than nurturing a, 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 a veteran or giving the veteran a benefit of the doubt. No, it's a very clear cut message from him that, We're after points. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how many years you've been in the league. I don't care if you're the captain. You're coming out of the lineup if you're not helping us win. So that's yeah, he said. Mark, he said he said we're not at a stage where we we try to get guys going. No, we cannot. That's it. That's, we're in the we're in the business of getting points. We need points. Yeah. It's very simple. It's very cut and dry. Uh, the Canadians are not there, so Martin Saint Louis doesn't have to do that. Um, it would be interesting. Like, let's say right now. They were in that phase. Let's say they were in the playoff race right now, or they were on the fringes of the playoff race. Like, is Josh Anderson still getting the minutes that he gets? Would he have been scratched at some point? Like, mm -hmm. I thought he had a great start to last night's game, and then as the game went on, he just kind of slowly got worse. And then at one point, he had the puck in the neutral zone last night. He just gave it back to the Flyers. Or he puck in his own end. He had time to make a decision with the puck and just flipped it literally right to a Flyers defenseman and said, here's the puck back, guys. And it's just little things like that that grow aggravating when you watch him play. And he's clearly not the best version of himself. Under normal circumstances, you would think he would have sat at some point and because he wasn't helping the team get points. But that's not their priority. And so, you know, prior to Pearson getting scratched, Marty went through a phase of like two or three days where he was very insistent on how well Tanner Pearson was playing. And this was a case I remember we were in Tampa and he was talking and he's like, well, listen, that's what I see. I don't know what you guys see. And I said, Marty, I'm going to be honest. I don't see it. Like I, 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 I want it. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm going to give you the benefit. Like, obviously you're the coach, but if you want my opinion, which he did, he asked for it. I was like, I just don't see what you're seeing with him. Like, I really don't. And and maybe it's yeah. just my untrained eye and, and you have a better eye. It's possible. He's like, no, you have a right to your opinion. I have a right to mine. And that's fair. I can see why you would say that. But he does a lot of little things, blah, blah, blah. Um, those kinds of decisions where he gives the benefit of the doubt to a veteran player, which I think is what he was doing with Tanner Pearson. And he was he was looking for – he was looking at elements of Pearson's game – that maybe go unnoticed, yeah. but the parts of his game that should be noticed were not noticeable. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a different calculation. And I think if you had to make the same decisions with some of these guys, um, I don't think Gallagher's in that conversation because I think he's playing some pretty effective hockey of late. And I, I think he's, he's been good. Like you just, you know, again, discard the salary, which is what Tortorella has done in Philadelphia. He's been good enough to be in the lineup. Josh uh, Tanner Pearson clearly not at this point, and uh, Josh Anderson. Some nights yes, some nights no. Like you just don't know. So it's 
you know, Josh Anderson is probably going to be here next year. Could the Canadians be in a position similar to the Flyers next year? Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. I don't think anyone predicted the Flyers to be in this position. No one predicted the Canucks to be in the position they're in. Maybe the Canadians could be on the fringes of the playoff race. And is 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 Marty going to be able to make those tough calls? Because the thing with Josh Anderson and Marty is like Marty is heavily personally invested in his improvement. He has spent so much time trying to adapt Josh Anderson's game and has been so public about it. And Josh has been so public about it that him not improving or not making those adjustments that they've worked on with him on a consistent basis. I could see that being difficult for the coach who's so invested in it to admit in a way and be like, Oh, well it hasn't worked what I'm doing with this guy. So now it's time to pull the plug. That's a tough admission when you're, when you're such a proud development style coach, you know, for sure. But I think that the difference between those two guys is that, Tortorella came in and from day one behind Philly's bench, the players knew what to expect from him, that he would be a hard ass. He would be hard, but fair. He would be the sort of guy that would, you know, squeeze the lemon as much as possible. Put, put the accountability level like to, to 11 and that, you know, what you see is what you get. And it's as though I'm not sure if there's a real, There was an awareness and a willingness on Tortorella's part to make the, his young players better. But I'm not sure if his handling is necessarily all that different than what it would be with a more seasoned group. Whereas for St. Louis, there's clear that he, he says, if I, was, if I was coaching a team that's much older, but mm -hmm. a, a team full of veterans... I wouldn't act the same way. I wouldn't coach the same way. I have to be aware of the fact that it's a young group and I have to deal with them the same way as I would as a, as a parent, as a father, where, you know, you look after a baby and what you expect from a baby when he's two years old or a kid when he's two years old or, and then six and then 12 is not going to be the same. So uh -huh. it's, it's, but as you say, I think it's, it's not about the message itself because he's going to be consistent with his message because from a, From right from the beginning, Martin Saint Louis, I think, has been very clear and very good at explaining what he wants, what he believes in, and what he expects from his players. But it's the margin of okay, this is enough. You know, you can teach, you can hope that your players mm -hmm. are going to stop making the same mistakes. But as you get better, the the margin of error and the acceptability of you've done that same mistake again. This has to, this has to. This has to close. And mm -hmm. as you raise the accountability, uh, your relationship with the players, it's a delicate um, interactions and, and sociological dynamic at play because when you become harder on people after you've been friendly, I would say, uh, then they might start looking at you. What, what, what's going on with him? You cannot do that overnight. You know, it's like uh, mm. those uh, assistant coaches who end up being the head coach overnight. They've been, they stay on the same team and they've been like almost uh, the typical friend of the player or whatnot. And all they're, now they're the guy in charge and they feel the need to change their voice, change who they are because they're in a different role. Now, it's not exactly the same, but for, for Marty, if he was coaching a good team, the, the expression of the accountability, I would, I would assume, Would make it so that he would he would be getting more strict, and that's it's a, it's a fine line to walk um, to to be able to do that. I think that he's got again. I think that he's got what it takes to do it, but it's a, it's an interesting balancing act. And in the meantime, just to prove my point, uh, Jack I said um, Marty tells us very often, "Don't mistake my kindness for weakness." So basically, mm -hmm. I'm kind with you guys. I'm I'm friendly and all that. I'm open, but th it that doesn't mean that I'm soft. So when it's time to to be to be to be tight, to be serious, and to be demanding, I'm going to be there. But that's that's going to ring true even more as the team goes from a bottom feeder type of team to a team that's getting more and more competitive. So I remember asking John Cooper about this because um, John Cooper, if you remember, you know, came into Tampa, rookie coach, 
had never no NHL experience of any kind, walked into a room that included Martin Saint Louis, um, but you know a, a veteran. You know, a lot of veterans, but a lot of guys that he coached in the AHL that he had a relationship with. Um, and it took him time to get that sort of authoritative accountability aspect to him and not the chummy, chummy coach kind of thing. And he said, uh, well, he gave kind of an answer when I asked about this. And it was kind of it was a little wishy-washy. I don't even remember what he said, but it was, it was unsatisfying, right? And so <laughs> <laughs> I was like... So I was like, okay, fine, you know, whatever. And uh, I was like, you don't feel like answering the question, frankly. That's fine. And he grabbed me after the scrum. And he's like, listen, yeah. he's like, what the one thing you can do as a coach, if you want to, is you have to, is ice time. It's the one lever you have. It's the only way you can send your message or to maintain that accountability. And if you remember just about, just over a year ago at this time, John Cooper was playing the Buffalo Sabres and he benched in that game, Nikita Kucherov, Steven Stamkos and Braden yes. Point. And he, and so this, we had this conversation this earlier this season. So it was like, or it might've actually been at this time last year. I think it was at this time last year. It was a very similar type of conversation. And he was like, sometimes that's, that's the bomb you got to drop, you know? And that's, you know, like John Cooper never played in the NHL. John Tortorella never played in the NHL. Sometimes it's maybe easier if you haven't played in the NHL to do that. You know, like to, you mm -hmm. don't have that perspective of how the player is going to receive this message. And so that's what I'm interested to see if Marty will have the ability to do or how he will do it in his own way. Um, if he needs to, you know, like it's what it's yeah. for sure. You're not going to have all your best guys going at all times. Um, but that's a gutsy move, you know, like John Cooper sat those guys said after the, that game, you know, they weren't, they weren't the guys who were giving us the best chance of winning. So I put out the best guys who gave us the best chance to win. You know, that was, that was a calculated move. You do it in game, you know, you're going to be asked about it and you decide in the moment, I'm going to go out in public and I'm going to, I'm going to say what I have to say. I'm going to explain yeah. my decision. You know, Tortorella has not done that. He still refuses to talk about benching Sean Couturier. <laughs> he did it again before the game yesterday. Yeah. And Sean Couturier even seems to be kind of in the dark as to what he's done so wrong. But the only explanation John Tortorella has given is very similar to what John Cooper said, is I'm going with the 20 guys and give me the best chance to win that night. And it's a different level of coaching that we haven't seen from Marty because he's not in that position. And even he said earlier this season, like our coaching staff is very developmental based. It's based on development. That's the sort of, you know, that's the the identity of the coaching staff is that. And clearly, Martin St. Louis' development chops should not be in question anymore. He's done just tremendous work. Just watch your Ray Slavkovsky play on any given night. I think Marty deserves a lot of credit for how he navigated that whole thing. And, you know, Slavkovsky deserves the most credit, let's be clear. But, like, the way Marty handled it, I think is a real feather in his cap as far as how, what he can do with young players. Um, but then it's, it's a different, it's a different thing. And they're either going to have to develop that or at some point the Canadians might have to consider bringing someone onto that staff that has that experience, the experience of coaching a winning team and, and having those standards applied and having that kind of accountability applied but the canadians aren't there yet but it might be something they have to consider down the road don't you think that uh, marty could say i've been on winning teams so i've got that experience i've seen it sure he could time. absolutely he could 100 and you know what he might not even need that help but the thing is like it's just a question you know because we don't know we haven't seen it yet but When Marty got hired, we hadn't seen him. You know, he's done nothing but good things, really. I can't think of, I can't think of anything major that Martin Saint Louis has done that I really disagreed with since he. There's there's been minor things. You know, I thought, I thought Brandon Gallagher should have been benched after that string of bad penalties he took. Uh, there was a game in Florida where Yol Armia took back to back bad penalties, and I thought he should have been benched. Um, but those are merit, but. In both cases, they were they required him to sit a veteran, and he refused to do it. So, yeah, that just kind of makes you wonder, 
when the time comes or when it's appropriate, will he exactly. be able to do it? Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, because he has not done that from day one. It's got, But it's it's a progression, right? The guy, the guy matures as a coach exactly as the team grows too. That's mm. pretty fascinating. You know, the guy, it's, it's, yeah, you can say, you can use the, the image of the, the baby and the, the young kid as much as you want. And God knows that Marty has been using it a lot. But is that if the team that he's coaching started as a baby, he himself as a head coach started as a baby too. And they're growing together. Yeah. So, yeah. and there's certain one, things that he one must thing I be, wanted to ask him when he, The one thing I want to ask him when he said that was, "How old do you think the team is now?" Yeah, but I couldn't. I couldn't use up. I had. I had actual questions I wanted to ask him myself. But I mean, he's like he used you know a baby to a two year old to a six year old to a ten year old to whatever. Yeah, you know where are they? Are they six? Are they ten? Are they you know? Are they nearing adolescence? You know, it's like it's. I don't know. It's. Uh, I think ten's a good number. From. Yeah, something like I, that. I think that. Yeah. Uh, they're going, uh, still going to go. They're going to, to go through uh, growing pains of well, teenagehood. Yeah, <laughs> that's they, around they the have corner. A serious, they have a serious growth spurt that's necessary. That's coming. Yeah, puberty's coming. Uh, puberty can be awkward. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see how awkward their puberty is. It hasn't hit a few of the, their guys. I mean, I wonder if uh, if Caden Primo's ever gonna have a, a hair on his face one day <laughs> he's got such if, a big if he's face. ever gonna if ever he's gonna shave yeah yeah, yeah. but um I wonder but yeah that. but you, good on him. okay one guy who's the, one guy though who's been uh growing up fast is Slavkovsky and you were you know uh -huh. you mentioned it a couple of minutes ago the fact that he's been um Marty's done a great job in terms of development and I mean, the the level of buy-in from Slavkovsky is from Slavkovsky has been evident. Uh, he's been embracing everything that's been thrown at him. A lot of openness into becoming a better player. And now we're it's uh, it's exciting. And I don't think that when when we look at this season, then we're going to say, well, you know, what are the the main positives? Because it's not a we, we cannot say it's a lost year. In the season when their their first overall pick from a year and a half ago takes such big leaps forward to the point where he went in the span of a few months a guy that that we considered sending back to the AHL to becoming like a bona fide first line uh, first line forward. So mm -hmm. and again against Philadelphia taking things into taking matters into his own hands at on certain occasions there was. This amazing drive that he took took the puck, you know, at the the top of the defensive uh, territory, and then carried it all the way. Made an amazing move just to hold it, to protect the puck against the defenseman and managed to uh, manage to make a shot on on Urson. But I think that the everything's coming together right now, and it's it's mm -hmm. just I know it's nothing earth shattering, and everybody. Everybody, every Canadian's fan in their living room watching him have, must have said in the past few weeks, if he's like that now, what is it going to be in three or four years? But here I am saying the same thing. It's super exciting to see. Yeah, it's it's hard not to it's hard not to write about him every game. Honestly, like I'm going to be flat, with, like flat out with you. I mean, it's just like he does something – Actually, it's not even something. He consistently does things over the course of every game, seemingly, uh, that impacts the game. You know, mm -hmm. I thought his forechecking against Philly was was top notch, man. He was being he's 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 starting the physicality of his forechecking is really starting to come in. Like he's finishing hits, um, and he's been doing something the last few games that I've noticed. You remember last season? There was a huge kind of thing about him playing with one hand on his stick. Um, he was losing his stick a lot. It was getting flipped in the air and stuff. And like, then he would look and, at the ref like, "What is it?" Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you look at them. They, he stopped doing that, which I think he recognized he had to stop. But he, uh, so in Colorado, he, um, he 
kind of generated a chance where he whacked the puck away from a defenseman in the offensive zone with one hand, bang, gets it down into the corner, works its way around, Slaff goes to the net, shot comes in, Slaff's there for the tip, but winds up blocking the shot instead, gathers the puck and sets up Nick Suzuki for a one-timer. So that one-handed whack, which David mm-hmm. Reinbacker is really good at, by the way, um, was to me, I was like, oh, look, he's learning how to use his reach. He did it four or five times against the Flyers. Same thing. On the forecheck, he's maybe a stride short of where he needs to be, throws his arm out, whacks the puck, knocks it off the stick, maintains possession in the offensive zone. So it's just it's just a little wrinkle. So I asked him about it after the game, and he's like, you know, it's something I've always tried. I was like, is that something new that you're incorporating into your game? He's like, well, I don't think it's new. I think I've tried to do it a lot. It's just you're noticing it because it's working. Like I'm actually doing it properly. I'm, I'm actually putting my stick in the right place. I'm able to, I'm actually positioned in the right place. He's like, I, I'm, I'm learning. I'm still learning where the puck is going, you know, and this is, this is an example of me learning that, you know, like, so it's really not about the move. It's everything else that goes with the move. And it goes back to Marty talking about touches with him, right? Like, the more touches you get is, is, is more evidence that you know where to go on the ice and that you're in the right spots. Well, those are touches. They're effective puck possession changing touches. And I, I thought he was that, that element was so effective. And I just feel like there are other things that Slavkovsky can do with his reach that will make him even more effective as an offensive player, mm-hmm. you know, changing the angles on his shots you know, reaching out to make passes, to change passing angles and stuff like that. Um, so this was, to me, evidence that he's starting to get that his reach is another advantage that he can exploit that he hasn't fully exploited yet. So, so yeah, when you say what's he going to be like in two, three, four years from now, I think in two years from now, he's going to have a full grasp of his entire palette of advantages and how best to use them in a given situation. And just the more information he gathers in his head about the NHL and how it works and where his place is in it and how he can best use his gifts in a given situation. Like that's a lot of information to compute in a split second, but the difference between his ability to compute it now to his ability to compute it in November. I mean, he's gone up like he's gone up like five grades of processors since he like he was using like you know an old like pentium processor from like seven years ago <laughs> in november and now he's up to whatever the hell the newest processor is now so it's 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 impressive and and he's honestly like he's he himself was talking in very frank terms after the game like this is uh i think it was Stu cowan Stu cowan mentioned to him after the game uh you seem to be getting better as the season goes along, and he just smiled. He said, "I'm just warming up." It was a good. It was a good line. <laughs> well, and he's got. I mean, we. You remember we spoke to him before he was drafted, and he was oozing confidence back then already. And so, oh, okay, that's the sort of personality that would work well in Montreal. And uh, he might have. He might have had a dip in confidence. At some point, you know, before getting hurt last year, and even again at the beginning of the season when things didn't click right away, but mm-hmm. I think that he never stopped doubting his own ability and the fact that he could he could adjust, and that's the thing right now is he's adjusted to the speed of the NHL, and he's developing his anticipation a lot in reading the play and expecting where the puck is going to be, acting in a way where. He's going to make the next play, like Marty likes to say. So he's not mm-hmm. he's not always like in reaction mode. He's very much into anticipation. So that when he takes his reads, assesses, and uh, he takes his information and and makes his move, what the result one of the results that we see is that sometimes his passing play is super fast. It, the puck mm-hmm. doesn't stay on his stick very long. And in situations where he could be shooting because of how he's positioned, he's going to be he's going to beat the goalie and the defendant uh, and the defenseman not only by deciding to pass instead of shoot where he would be in a position to shoot, 
but also by the quickness that he decides to pass. And, and he finds an open teammate that's ready for that pass. You know, the, the goal in the power play yesterday, so the Suzuki goal, yes, the pass was maybe, you know, not exactly very precise and, and Suzuki very, uh, deftly adjusted with his, with his skate and, and, but he still scored the goal, but it was just a bang, bang play where, uh, Slavkovsky reacts so fast now and he passes quickly. He sees the ice. When we talk about the game slowing down, that's what it means is because it's not the game that's slowing down. It's just you processes faster and are able yeah. to act faster. And so on that goal, the- but on that goal, you'll notice, um, Matson has the puck up top and Slavkovsky's tapping his stick on the ice like really fast. Like he saw that lane to Suzuki was open, but with Matheson still having the puck and he's like, yeah. God damn it. Give me the, give me the puck. Like, this is, if you give me the puck, there's a goal there. You could see it. And it just, that's yeah. why it was on his stick and off because he'd already seen it and he'd already seen the lane and it was closing. And so the urgency was getting ramped up and uh, you know, and he's like, a 19-year-old telling a 30-year-old NHL veteran tapping his stick on the ice, like, give me the, give me the damn puck. That's a good sign. You know, it's like, and, and it worked and he, he pulled it off and, and, and the goal was scored, you know, so he and, was right. And how right often, how often do you see players tapping their stick because they see a pass? Usually they tap the stick because they think that they got a good shooting lane. You know, whether in that case, it's more like, no, 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 I see a pass. I, there's an option here. So yeah, give me the it. puck so exactly. I can pass it. That's, uh, yeah. that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. It. It's good. It's good. There's nothing, nothing bad to be said about that guy. And honestly, like every game, it just seems, it does literally seem to be getting better and better. And so it's, it's really, so when we, you know, when we start the show, we started the show talking about, how can you bring what you do over the last 12 games or 10 games now uh, over to next season? Like a guy like Slavkovsky, I feel it's just every game seems to be leading up to something better next season for him individually. Yeah. And just, and just the, the level of insurance and, and, and excitedness that he has for his own future and the team's future Um is a huge game changer for this organization. You know, like th- for the longest time, it's been a question, like we don't have elite offensive talent. I still don't think Uri Slavkovsky is ever going to be in the Nathan McKinnon, Connor McDavid stratosphere of elite forwards, but he's going to be a pretty elite offensive talent. I am pretty, I feel pretty confident saying that like, he is going to be one of the top wingers in the NHL at some point. And that's that's a very interesting piece for the Canadians to have because no one in the league right now is built like him and can do the things that he does at that size. That player doesn't exist. No. The Canadians, he's one of one. He's really the Canadians have that guy, and that's that's why they drafted him because they believed that that uniqueness would be a benefit, and um, it's looking more and more like that every day. But there's a, there's, a, I know that you say that uh, he's not going to. I agree with you that he's not going to be that uh, that guy who can be like the top echelon of the forwards. But at the same time, okay, I don't go, I don't want to get carried away because I agree with your premise there. But there are a few examples of players who have consistently gotten better over the course of their career. Brad Marchand being one, Martin Saint Louis mm-hmm. being one. If he's got that X factor in him and he continues to get better past 25 because of the unique package that he's got, it could unlock if he, if, if his, if his tr- upward trends continues, you know, until he hits 32 years old, for example, if he keeps getting better, there is a mm. chance that he could become a superstar based on the attributes that he's got, you know? So it's, but again, I, I, I find it, Marchand and Saint-Louis, Marchand and Saint-Louis have something that very, 
very few players have, and it would be great if they, if they were all like them, but it's not the case. But we just don't know if Slav is going to be one of those guys. And if he is, honestly, with that package, this guy is the limit. But for the time think, being, yeah. I mean, I look at Rick Nash scored 41 goals as a 19-year-old, but I think Slav's ideal ceiling, like if he hits and does exactly what you just mentioned, like I think he can be – He could be like Rick Nash. Like that's the, that's yeah. the best case. I think that's the best case scenario. And God, if that, if that works out, then I think the Canadians would be thrilled, you know? And so, and that's like, you know, that's a solid 30 to 40 goal scorer, point of game guy, physical, imposing, difficult to handle, good power play guy. Like it's, it's 20 minute a night player, top line player in the, you know, in the conversation for maybe a Rocket Richard award at some point, who knows possibly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just a, 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 a strong skating, highly skilled power forward with a, a really imposing frame and a guy who knows how to use that frame to his advantage. I mean, Rick Nash, there was no one better than Rick Nash skating down the wing, cutting to the middle defenseman on his back and just driving the puck to the net and scoring a crazy goal. Yeah. Again, so, You know, if, if your Isla Koski can, can be that with probably a bit, I would not even a bit, probably a higher playmaking floor than, than Nash had. Um, but if you can be that style of player, high shot volume, just an offensive force every night, I think, I think that's a good goal for, for your Isla to set for himself. It's something that's, I think, realistic at that point, at this point, which I think the Rick Nash comparison was kind of there in theory, when they picked him, but it seemed far-fetched. It seems less and less far-fetched, I think, with every game he plays, because it just looks like he's a kid who could turn into that. Yeah, because he can be a Even though Nash, every, Nash had it figured game. out. Yeah, Nash had it figured out far quicker than Slav did, but... Um, but yeah, but he's not someone think, who got better significantly after he reached that, like, that stardom level. You know, he didn't continue to he was improve just, a ton. He was, consistently, he was consistently good for a very long time. Like, he yeah. he scored 41 goals as a 19-year-old. He scored 42 goals as a 30-year-old for the Rangers. And in between, wow. had another 40-goal season and multiple 30-goal seasons. Um, just, he set a high bar early and then stayed at that yeah, bar. It. Like, he basically yeah. just remained consistently excellent for – You know, 12, 13 years. Like it was, yeah, uh, yeah maybe 12 years. So it was a yeah, pretty remarkable career. 437 goals in his career, 800 points. So so we'll see how um, how uh, Slav will develop in the long term. But in the short term, I suspect that Slovakia would be very happy to have him around for the world championships. Uh, that'd yes. be a very, you know, he, he, would, he led them as an 18 year old. So as a, even as a 17 year old. So that he version, played there that, si he played on that team at 16. Yeah. But the real difference maker was when he was 17, but yes, he oh, was there he, as 16. Yeah. Uh, the Canadians, but he was, he entered yeah, the key. He, he arrived on the Canadians radar because he played in that event at 16. <laughs> I think that was a big, that was a big factor for them. Yeah, it's just so few of them play at 16. But uh, I wanted to no. transition to the World Championships because um, it's it's coming. It's that sort of discussion is coming at this late stage of the season. We brought it up uh, a couple of weeks ago when it came to, or was it maybe last week uh, when it came to Caden Gooley because you know he's he's in the he's in the hockey Canada. Uh, universe and and he's basically he's been on their radar before he, he he would love to play there but I would like to you know look at a few other guys that could be candidates and if it would be relevant for them to go and um, well it, we, we could start I mean we could start with Nick Suzuki because I mean <laughs> there's this uh, tournament the, uh, the the four nations face off that will serve next year as a warming up com competition uh, before the Olympics. 
And I view it as a possibility maybe to change the guards um, among the Canadian team. Uh, maybe give a last hooray, last chance of some older players to see if they still got it at the international level. And if not, if there was a possibility to transition for the Olympics to maybe a newer generation. But you look at Suzuki right now and you look at the uh, Team Canada, I mean – McDavid, McKinnon, Crosby, Reinhardt, Point, Marner, Stone, if he's healthy, and Beda. To me, those guys, that's that's eight guys. To me, they would be locks to be part of any international competition, whether it's the, the Four Nations or the, the Olympics. Then you got mm-hmm. like high quality candidates, Byfield, Ryan O'Reilly, uh Thomas. In St. Louis, mm-hmm. Barzal, Verhage, Hyman, Konechny, Horvat, Marchesso. That's a lot of guys. And who knows, a year from now, if kids like Seth Jarvis or Wyatt Johnston will have elevated their play to the point where you really can't go without them. So, And you've got those oldies that I was telling you about, mm-hmm. like Stamkos, Tavares, or Marchand. Uh, it I seems said. to me like... I mentioned Sid right off the the top. Uh, okay. I, I think Sid would be, yeah. No, I, Sid's a lock. Yeah. To me, yeah, Sid's a lock. Sid's a lock. But Stamkos, Tavares. I mean, especially Tavares and Marchand. They're on the they're on the brink of you know the, a decline that will would make force Team Canada to make tough decisions and say sorry, guys, but now we've got to turn to to younger uh, younger heads and crazier heads. So, but that's another a lot of names there. So for Suzuki, mm-hmm. looking at that, I think it would be a mistake to, even though he's got a great season and he's continuing this on this upward trend, to think that he would be one of those locks for either the Four Nations competition or the uh, or the Olympics. So in that view, in that sense, wouldn't it be wise for him to go to the World Championships? Well, so we've had. I guess some development on this on this dossier this week uh, on Monday or Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday um, at Morning Skate in Denver. Um, actually, no, it was Monday after practice in Seattle. Uh, Luke Jelina have already asked, asked Nick Suzuki about the Olympics, and he said it's something I think about a lot. Something I'd really like to make that team. Um, I I. I I want to be there. Any player would want to go to the Olympics. I think I, I think I have a shot. I'd like to. I'd like to try and make that team. Then, mm-hmm. a few days later, Michael Russo at the Athletic wrote a story uh, talking to Bill Guerin about Team USA and how he will look at who decides to go to the World Championships, especially for bubble guys, um, as being an indicator of how committed they are to USA hockey. And I think the quote was, if you'd rather go to the Caribbean than play in the World Championships, then maybe you're not that committed. Something to that effect. Um, <laughs> in that same article, Doug Armstrong was quoted, the general manager of, of the Canadian Olympic team and the Four Nations team, uh, was quoted as suggesting something similar. Like, not quite as harsh as Bill Guerin was, which is no surprise, but saying, you know, it it well it couldn't hurt you know basically like it's yeah. it's if you're if you're kind of on the fringes if you go to the worlds that'll help we'll be we'll be able to see you in an international environment international hockey is different um so then that happens and um and actually michael in his story specifically named nick suzuki as saying so canadians captain nick suzuki if you want to go to the olympics maybe you might want to go to the world championships well Nick Suzuki hadn't been asked, as far as I knew, about the World Championship. So after the game last night, um, I asked him about it. I said, listen, I saw what you said about the Olympics and everything. So would that influence your decision if Hockey Canada came and asked you to go to the World Championships this year? Would that influence your decision in any way? And he was uh, he was pretty kind of non – like he, he was not Less in the middle about thrill. it. Less than thrilled, I would say. Like he's, you know, he started by saying that's a tough question. Uh, you know, Olympics are two years from now, and I was like, yeah, but the Four Nations is is next year. It's coming up, and that's you know, 
you wouldn't want to be on that team. That's the best on well, it's not the best on best, but it's a it's the best of those four nations best tournament. Um so he said uh if I feel like I need to go to prove myself, I can go to the tournament. I think a lot of the scouting of the players, we play against the top talent in the whole world here. It's hard to say. So he says he hasn't made a decision, but to say that he seemed unenthusiastic about the possibility of going to the Worlds would be a bit of an understatement. But I really do think that if he does want to go to the Olympics, going to the World Championships would not would be a smart thing for him to do. Um, same with Sam Montembeau, by the way, and same with Cole Caulfield, actually, which I haven't had a chance to talk to Cole Caulfield about it. Sam Montembeau kind of, you know, I asked him in, I think it was Edmonton, uh, and he seemed also kind of noncommittal, said he'd have to see how he feels at the end of the season, would want to talk to his his better half and his and his family and what have you. Um, but, you know, obviously had a great experience last year and put him on the radar for this team. Like, he's... Doug Armstrong, I talked to him when they were in Montreal, and he was really impressed with Sam Montembeau at the World Championships. Thought that performance left an impression on him. So he's got a leg up because of what he did at the World Championships last year. Does that mean he could blow them off this year? Probably not. Uh, there's, you know, while the competition isn't great in goal, you know, Bennington's having a good year. Uh, Aiden Hill's having a good year. Even Tristan Jari. There's Stuart Skinner. There's there's guys. It's not the best of the best, but Montembeau's in a bit of a dogfight if he wants to make that team. Suzuki, with all the names you just mentioned, is kind of the same kind of deal. You know, it's. Uh, I was looking at it because he would he mentioned how he thought his role would be kind of a PK two way guy. Um, you know. Among Canadian forwards that are maybe possibilities to go and, and guys who play more on the penalty kill than Suzuki does, Suzuki averages a minute a game on the penalty kill. Sorelli, Anthony Sorelli, who's probably not a candidate, but could be, uh, 211 per game. Uh, Sam Reinhardt, 207. Seth Jarvis, 203. Mitch Marner, 203. Brandon Hagel's probably not a real candidate, but still 203. Uh, you mentioned Mark O'Reilly Stone. O'Reilly must be there. O'Reilly's up there, 147. Yeah. Uh, Phil Deneau, who you didn't mention, who I think maybe is on the fringes of this conversation as a role guy, 151, a role guy, face-off guy. Like, I mean, if you're building a team, having Phil Deneau as your fourth center, like, would make you a bad team. I mean, it's like, it's kind of, I guess him and O'Reilly and, and others would be kind of competing, and, and Suzuki, Sorelli. frankly. Yeah. And Sorelli yeah. would be competing for that role. Um, but there's a lot of guys here. Mark Stone's at 135. Like Nick Suzuki is way down the list, you know? So it's uh, Bo Horvat, I guess, could be considered for that role too. I don't know. It's a possibility. But, um, so, yeah, it's, it's – I think any chance that Suzuki can get to kind of prove his chops, like when he says, if I have to go there and prove myself, I think the answer to that is, yeah, I think you do. <laughs> you know, you're like, I think you do because the competition ahead of you is is tough. It's really, really tough. It's going to be a tough sledding for him to get in there. I mean, especially because considering the bar for like the offensive bar is so high now. Like, yeah, you're a 90 point player. You're 35 points, 40 points out of the scoring race. Whereas it used to be you were a 90 point player. You were winning the scoring race, <laughs> like not that long ago, like 20 years ago, you know? So it's, it's really, uh, it's going to be a tough road for him. So I think. Going to Worlds, if he's healthy and if he feels up to it, then I think it would be beneficial for him reaching his goal of making the Olympic team. Yeah, so he was uh, he played uh, at the U-17 tournament with Canada, the white team. Uh, uh -huh. And then he was at the World Juniors, obviously, that, that one year in, uh, in January that didn't go so well. 19. No, yeah. five games. But that's, a, that's it. So sometimes, you know... Being uh, showing that you want to be part of the club is can be a good thing. And but since you mentioned uh, Bill Guerin and, and talking that way from the American perspective, uh, mm -hmm. let me just quickly do the sim a similar exercise with Caulfield because it's going to be tough for Caulfield too. Yeah, uh, for sure. So ahead of yeah, so there are 13 guys that seem to me like they would be locks. Matthews. JT Miller, the two Kachucks, 
Jack Eichel, Jack Hughes, Jake Genzel, uh, Vincent Trocek, Kyle Connor, Clayton Keller, Dylan Larkin, Jason Robertson, and uh, Chris Kreider. So that's 13. And oh. then you got a mix of Brock Baser, Matthew Boldy, Tage Thompson, uh, yeah. Debrinkit. Uh, you got uh, you got Nelson there, maybe not as much, but it depends on the personality they want to give their fourth line. Uh, so Nelson, Nick Schmaltz, maybe Pavelski if he's still around, maybe Kane if he's still around. But that's already you know you're you're closing in on 20 guys that can, that are candidates that are all of them almost as deserving as Caulfield. I think yeah. that with a push and you know uh, the, the the improvements he's made to his overall game this year will help him well. I think with a very good season next year, he could become more of a front runner in that conversation. But that's that's almost well, a, be. A, a reserve spot among a group. You know that if you've got to beat Besser, Boldy, uh, and and Thompson, that's that's a tough ask already. So again, he'd be in a good situation uh, if he chose to go to the Worlds this year. I mean, the Mind thing you, about it would it be is- easier for yeah. Well, it's just that you're talking about probably a fourth line spot um, because you look at it. I mean, you know that that story, the Russo story, has like a, a sort of a, a mock up of the U.S. team. See, the way that they have it lined up here, it's like Connor Matthews, Keller, uh, Brady Kachuk, Jack Hughes, Matthew Kachuk, Gensel, Eichel, Miller. So then you have Robertson and Larkin. They even have Trocheck out of out of the starting lineup. It's a 13th forward. And you got Tage Thompson right. here on right wing. So you look at Tage Thompson, Cole Caulfield. To me, the guy that's the best fit for that role is Matthew Boldy, personally. Um, just because, the, you know, just because of the all around nature of his game and like, you know, just the combination of size and, and everything. Like Thompson's having a bit of a comeback to earth season this year. Is obviously not scoring at the same rate as he did, just like Caulfield. But, Like that's why Caulfield's in tough. Like Caulfield's going to have to take one of the other spots. Like he's going to have to take one of like Connor or one of the Kachucks, Gensel, Miller, Keller, one of those spots to be like higher up in the lineup as a scorer, you know? And, and, and so yes, the improvements to his all around game are going to help, but it's, 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 it's a tough road ahead. Like he's going to need one hell of a season next year to get on this radar. But again, In his case, just like Suzuki's case, you can help that process along by going to the World Championships. Especially with yeah, how explicitly Bill Guerin talked about the World Championships. And how how would he fare for a player of his style? How would he fare on the big ice? The, yeah. If he was given a chance to play in the uh, the Four Nations face-off, it would be in North America. This is your chance now to show in the World Championships that you can be very impactful on uh, on Olympic ice where it's going to be uh, where it's going to happen in Cortina d'Ampezzo in in 2026 or in Milan actually uh, yeah. Cortina d'Ampezzo will be uh, obviously the skiing will they be playing on the will they be playing on international ice in, or will I they be playing on NHL ice Mil- well in I don't Milan, know I think it's got international that's a good question I assume that it was in it was that at the Olympics you play yeah Yeah, know. but with the inclusion of NHL players, I just I wonder if they would I would wonder if they would play on NHL ice. Because the NHL well, players haven't yeah, I don't know what they did in Nag- Nagano, I think it was Olympic ice. Mm-hmm. And Lillehammer also had NHL. No, Lillehammer did not. Um well actually it was Turin. Torino had had NHL players. I don't know if they played on Olympic ice or not. Anyhow. Um Okay. Let's go to uh, a guy that might have a chance. A guy that might have a better chance is Caden Primo because uh, Caden Primo is it's it's interesting because he's got. You look at the the American goalies that won't be in the playoffs this year for the World Joey Championships, Decor, not the Olymp- not the Olympics. No, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah the, sorry, the, uh, the World Championships. Yeah, yes. he used to be a third goal. Yeah, no, he's got no chance for the Olympics. <laughs> he has no chance to make the Olympic team. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 no. The world, yeah. the world championships. Uh, no, I mean there's Dustin Wolf, Alex Lyon, Joey Decord, good old Charlie Lindgren. If if Charlie doesn't make the playoffs with the Caps, gosh, mm-hmm. who knows at this point? But it's a it's a it's a thinner group. 
you wanted to move on. That's a good idea. I wanted to go to, yeah, I wanted to go to, so let's go to Future Friday. Future Friday. So, Future Friday this week, we wanted to, uh, well, obviously, there's various playoffs going on all over the place. Um, you know, Owen Beck is is guaranteed a spot in the, in the Memorial Cup, obviously, uh, but he's uh, he's having a hell of a, a, a run here in the OHL. And he's, he is scoring goals at a, at a ridiculous rate right now that I find very interesting. But... Um, and he started uh, off well. His first playoff game, three assists, and he was second star of the game. And he was, uh, yeah, he was very impactful in his first playoff game with Saginaw. Yeah, so, so it looks good. It does look good, and I think he's going to be going to be an interesting player to watch in camp next year. But like, he finished the regular season fifty-one points in thirty-two games with Saginaw after getting thirty points in twenty-five games with Peterborough. So. Mm. Being surrounded by talent helps. <laughs> it's just definitely, yeah. definitely made a difference for him. But I mean, I, you just you look at all, a lot of his goals, and they're just snipes. You know, like his shot, I feel, has taken a step, and so it'll be interesting to see. Um, but you, uh, well, I think what's interesting here is is you had you had a chance to chat with William Trudeau recently, and he's like become yeah. sort of the forgotten man in the whole defense mix, you know, after having such a, an impressive training camp uh, last year, was it? Yeah. It wasn't this year, was it? Well, both. Well, even, well both, I mean, really, yeah. I remember, I mean, in Buffalo this year, uh, Jean-Francois was saying, oh, he was running the whole show. So yeah. it looked as though, you know, he was, he would be ready to continue on the trajectory of last year, but really last mm -hmm. year was a, coming out party for him. You remember he had a he had the possibility of going back to juniors as a 20-year-old or to stay and to move to Laval. They took him with the Rocket, started off there as a seventh defenseman, and by year's end, he was on their top, top pair. So that's right. the sort of growth that they saw in this kid. So a guy, I mean, fourth rounder that – I don't think anybody thought too much of to begin with. You know, he was a he was a decent prospect, but nothing that would make him that would put him in the conversation along with all the other defensemen that the Canadians have. So, but he had that season last year and forced himself into that that conversation. But here's the thing, though, with Trudeau is that there's so many guys in the system, and he's on mm -hmm. he's a left side a left shot defenseman. That you really a, a player in the, in this position where he's a bit of a an underdog in that whole inner competition thing. He's a bit of a step behind. He cannot he cannot lag. He has to continually improve. And he had a we did, I, I I bring him bring him up today because we haven't discussed we haven't named him at all this year. And uh, and William Trudeau. Started off the year very slowly uh, in Laval. The first half of the season, I mean, he, he lost his confidence at some point, and instead of keeping things uh, simple, he would try sometimes too hard to join the rush and wanted to be involved um, uh, offensively. But you had Mayu there, who basically took his spot on the power play, and there was always one of Jack Eye or Baron there uh, that also took time away uh, from uh, on the PP for him. So he was reduced basically to, to try to generate points five on five. Uh, he started doing a bit of PK, which he had not done last season. So it was a, it was a year for him where he was not going to really necessarily showcase himself offensively a great deal via the power play, but a year where he needed to round out his game because he was one of those, many rocket defensemen that are more offensively minded than, mm -hmm. than really defensively uh, astute. So he had to, I guess, at some point he had to learn to 
not force plays, uh, learn to let the game come to him, be more patient with it. And something clicked, and at some point he got he got into a rhythm, and he said, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I've started playing on PK, blocking shots, uh, cutting uh, passing lanes too, and I feel like overall I've improved myself defensively uh, compared to 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 what it was in the past. And Jean-François Hull told me about Trudeau. He said, what I like about him is that he's aggressive, he wins most of his battle, and gosh, that's something that in Laval they keep – harping on that point, winning your battles. Mm -hmm. And that's something that Trudeau does. Uh, he's also a guy that really shows up every night, who, who who battles every night. And some guys also have had issues with that. Um, and he says, I think that there's more to him than what we've seen so far. So I would not say that he's declined or there there's you know something that he unraveled in any way this year. Mm -hmm. I still think that he has continued to develop himself this year. But he remains in a tough spot because he might be a victim of the numbers game, despite the fact that he's been such a pleasant surprise uh, since he was drafted and since he joined uh, the professional ranks. Yeah. Yeah. He is in a tough spot, but he does get a little bit of a reprieve just kind of in closing here. Uh, for those who weren't following uh, Rogla completed their sweep of Fariestad in the SHL playoffs, which means Adam Engstrom has another round of playoffs ahead of him. So he will not be heading over He's to North America. Go. He's not going to be here in time. I mean, it's basically if they were to sweep no. or get swept game four of their series, their next series is against your favorite team, Mark Antoine against the, the Vax, Vax, no, Vax, <laughs> Vax, you Vax tell Joe, me Vax <laughs> Lakers. I don't, I don't know how to say it, but I know it's your favorite team. Um, <sighs> Game four of that series of between Rogla and the Lakers, which is my actual, my favorite basketball team, would be Wednesday, April 10th. So that's the earliest that series could possibly end, which leaves a bit of runway for the HL schedule, but I don't know. It just doesn't seem like a realistic timeline. I mean, it could end as late as April 16th, and so it doesn't seem like a real realistic timeline in terms of getting them into the rocket lineup, which – would probably not come at Trudeau's expense, but would come at someone's expense that's been an important part of the team. Maybe Gallipo, um, that's been an important part of the team all year. So that's yeah. maybe Gallipo, one, one headache that... For Norlander. Can I Gallipo scratch, for, scratch for Norlander? Well, there you go. Um, I mean, so there's already kind of a, a log jam, so this would just only add yeah. more pressure on Hull. Um, so it doesn't look like that's something like J.F. Hull is going to have to manage uh, in any meaningful way. Uh, for at least another week or so. So, yeah, but it's uh, when when you talked the other day about how Mike Matheson told you that next training camp will be wild because of the sheer number of defense prospects that are going to be at camp vying for spots. Uh, well, Trudeau is just one on that that long long list, and he's he seems to me like the sort of guy who will probably not have a career in Montreal, but has a chance to showcase himself so that he finds an NHL spot somewhere based on the work that he will have gone, he will have done within the Canadians organization, you know? So um, who knows? He might be, uh, who knows if one day he won't be a Francois Beauchemin type. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> who knows? All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks for everyone for listening. Uh, remember Monday's our mailbag episode. So, you can send your questions in to Basu and Godet at gmail.com or send them in on X. The handle is at Basu and Godet. Uh, have an excellent weekend. I will be in Laval tonight to watch the Rocket take on the Senators. And then obviously the Canadians, the, the Rocket take on the Senators again on Saturday. And the Canadians take on the Carolina Hurricanes. It's the Bell Center. And then we will talk to you on Monday. Thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>